Imagine a world ruled by unbreakable codes and mathematical impossibility. Until one outcast saw the pattern. Alan Turing, the mind who built computers before they existed, cracked the Nazi enigma and saved millions. Britain repaid him with humiliation and death. How did the father of your digital future become history's most tragic casualty of genius? The answer begins with his first, world-altering idea. Alan Turing's mind never worked like anyone else's. At Sherborne School, teachers called him a genius before he turned 14. While classmates struggled through Latin and history, Turing filled notebooks with chess problems and mathematical puzzles. He devoured Einstein's theory of relativity as a teenager, writing private notes that showed a grasp of abstract physics far beyond his years. Even then, he saw patterns where others saw only confusion. He didn't fit in, and he didn't care. By his early 20s, Turing was asking a question no one else dared. What if a machine could do anything a human mind could do, given the right instructions? In 1936, at just 24, he published a paper that changed everything. He described a theoretical device, a universal machine, that could read a string of symbols, follow a list of rules, and solve any problem that could be described in logical steps. The universal Turing machine wasn't a blueprint for hardware. It was the foundation for the entire field of computer science. Every programmable device, every algorithm, every line of code, Turing's paper made them possible decades before the first real computer existed. Joan Clark, one of the few people who could keep up with him, saw the scale of his thinking. She later described him as someone who lived in a world of pure logic, always searching for the next big idea. Turing's universal machine was proof. It gave the world a new way to think about information, and it gave Turing the mental tools he'd need when war and the Enigma code came calling. German radio traffic poured in by the hour, each message locked behind a wall of numbers. The Enigma machine didn't just scramble words, it created 159 quintillion possible settings. That's a one followed by 18 zeros, even if every person on Earth tried a combination every second, it would take millions of years to break a single day's code by hand. And at midnight, the Germans twisted the knife. Every rotor, every plug board setting, every possible arrangement. Reset. The slate wiped clean. Yesterday's breakthrough became useless. At Bletchley Park, rows of intercepted signals piled up on desks. Some were weather reports, some were orders for submarine attacks. None could be read. Allied convoys zigzagged across the Atlantic, hunted by U-boats they couldn't see. Each ship that vanished into the ocean meant lost lives, lost supplies, and another step closer to defeat. The mathematicians and linguists at Bletchley worked in 12-hour shifts, fighting exhaustion, frustration, and the creeping sense that the problem was unsolvable. They knew the cost of failure wasn't just numbers on a chalkboard, it was ships burning, sailors drowning, families waiting for letters that would never arrive. The pressure was relentless. Every midnight, the clock reset. Every morning, the codebreakers started again. They weren't just racing against German engineers, they were racing against time against the scale of the impossible, against the chance that Britain might not survive another year of war. In that chaos, Alan Turing searched for a crack in the armor, a way to turn the enemy's impossible numbers into a problem a human mind could solve. The first bomb arrived at Bletchley Park in 1940. It looked nothing like a modern computer, seven feet wide, taller than most people, and packed with banks of spinning drums. The engineering was raw, but the logic behind it was pure Turing. Each bomb was built to mimic Enigma's rotors, running through thousands of settings 
at a speed no human could match. The secret weapon wasn't just the machine itself, it was the method Turing called a crib. If you guessed a likely phrase hidden in the German code, you could wire the bomb to test every possible rotor position until it found settings that turned gibberish into sense. The process was mechanical, but the insight was human. The real backbone of the operation was a team of young women from the Women's Royal Naval Service, the REMS. They worked in shifts, day and night, threading menus of wires across the machine's front, setting drums, and logging every run by hand. The room thundered with the sound of motors and relays. Each shift meant hours on their feet, monitoring for the telltale stop that might mean a breakthrough. When the machine halted, they'd record the settings and pass them to the crypt analysts, who checked for a genuine solution. Most stops were dead ends, but every correct one meant a day's worth of German orders suddenly readable. The Wren's precision and stamina kept the bombs running around the clock, squeezing every possible advantage out of Turing's invention. In those crowded, noisy rooms, the impossible started to look like just another day's work. By early 1942, Bletchley Park was decrypting about 39,000 German messages every month. That's more than a thousand a day, each one a thread in the web of war. The scale was staggering. Naval orders, U-boat positions, Luftwaffe attack plans, all pouring in, no longer hidden behind Enigma's wall of numbers. Every decrypted message meant a convoy rerouted, a ship saved, a trap avoided. The intelligence didn't just reach British command, it shaped the entire Allied strategy. Convoys began slipping past wolf packs that once seemed unstoppable. The Battle of the Atlantic, once a slow-motion disaster, started to turn. By 1943, the pace doubled. Bletchley's teams were reading two messages every minute, day and night. The impact rippled outward, fewer ships lost, more supplies reaching Britain, and the balance of power shifting away from Nazi Germany. Historians now estimate that the work at Bletchley Park, driven by Turing's breakthroughs, shortened the war by at least two years. That's not just a number, that's millions of lives, soldiers who returned home, families that stayed whole, futures that weren't erased by war. The victory wasn't won with tanks or bombers, but with logic, teamwork, and a relentless drive to turn chaos into understanding. The scale of what Turing and his colleagues accomplished is almost impossible to measure. But every life saved, every year of peace gained, traces back to the rooms at Bletchley and the minds that refused to accept impossible odds. In 1952, a British courtroom handed Alan Turing a choice, prison or a so-called cure. The charge was gross indecency, his only crime, loving another man. Turing chose the medical route, hoping to keep his mind free for work. What followed was a year of forced hormone therapy, weekly injections of synthetic estrogen at Manchester Royal Infirmary. The treatment was blunt and brutal. It aimed to strip away desire, but it took more than that. His body changed. He grew breasts. He lost strength, energy, and the sharpness that had once set his mind apart. The side effects left him exhausted, anxious, and deeply isolated. The government that once relied on his genius now labeled him a security risk. His security clearance was revoked. He was cut off from classified research, denied the chance to work on the next generation of computers. The man who had helped save millions was now seen as a liability. The punishment was clinical, methodical, and devastating. Turing's vulnerability was exposed, not by his own actions, but by a system determined to erase difference in the name of order. On June 7, 1954, Alan Turing was found dead in his home. Cyanide poisoning. He was 41 years old. On the bedside table, a half-eaten apple, never tested. 
but enough for the coroner to rule suicide. The man who had saved millions, who laid the foundation for every computer and algorithm in use today, was gone. His brilliance erased by the same system that once depended on it. There was no public mourning, no national tribute. For decades, the state kept his work secret, and his name buried. It took nearly 60 years for the government to even acknowledge what had been done. In 2013, Queen Elizabeth II signed a royal pardon. Four years later, Parliament passed a law posthumously pardoning 49,000 men, convicted under the same charge. These apologies arrived long after Turing could hear them. His mind, his future, his chance to see the world he made, all lost. No pardon can return what was taken. In 1936, Alan Turing published the blueprint for all modern computers. A single idea that shapes every device today. By 1942, his Bombay machines were reading up to 39,000 German messages a month, helping shorten World War II by at least two years, and saving millions of lives. But in 1952, British courts convicted him for being gay, forcing him to undergo chemical castration. His security clearance was revoked, and just two years later, Turing died from cyanide poisoning at age 41. The exact circumstances of his death remain debated. Some files on Bletchley Park operations are still classified. Today, every algorithm and AI system builds on Turing's work. In 2013, the UK government issued a royal pardon, and Turing's law followed in 2017. But these came decades too late. The facts are clear. Turing's genius transformed our world, yet prejudice destroyed his future. The systems we build now will decide if we repeat that mistake.